I was never much of a romantic type, or very good looking for that matter. In fact, I was probably something of a bore. Too concerned with Ouija boards and plate tectonics to really care about girls. Just kidding, I was not that smart. The only reason I made the class chess team is because I caught the captain jerking off in the locker room and told him I'd squeal if he didn't let me come to Springfield before the state finals. After high school, I enrolled in a community college on the outskirts of town. I was madly in love with Roxanne, and despite my initial timidity, had forsaken a career in the army to follow her to school. The boys in green at the Outland Mall had tried to recruit me on several occasions. The important thing is, is that I was trying. What's that line about blindly attempting something over and over and over again? The object of my heart's desire had to be getting closer, one failure at a time. As it goes, Roxanne ran off with a campus security guard that spring. Apparently, they used to share cigarettes outside the library, not that either of us had really been inside. Alas, I would never be more than the boy serendipitously sitting across from her in astronomy or intro to life sciences. God damn it, I borrowed five grand just to get next to her, and she didn't even so much as bat an eyelid when we happened to have chosen identical schedules that first year out of high school. I'd have to get out of this town, adopt a different tactic. Perhaps I could grow sideburns and start jogging. I bought a bus ticket and made for the coast. I lost my virginity in middle school to a whale of a wonderful woman, and my Uncle Ronnie had taught me from an early age that the larger ones also need affection. But where it came from didn't really matter. We all put cornstarch in our cornflakes in the morning, so you know where this is going. But why bring up my sex life? You were wondering, where are you? <laughs> uh, because Ro Roxanne's disappeared because with Roxanne's disappearance, it had all but disappeared. Not that she would have touched me with a 10-foot pole, mind you, but her sudden and absolute absence from the dining hall, the corner store, that dirty, downtrodden family restaurant, the very fabric of my life had shaken me to the core. I could barely look at another woman, much less ever be with one. So there it began, in the back of a California-bound Greybound, my celibate journey to the moon. I got to Los Angeles with $27 in a sleeping bag. It really wasn't so bad. When I left the station, the air was hot and sweet with the smell of carbon and chilies. All the same, the city had an underbelly that made me uneasy. Tramps and trannies, hobos and toothless hockey players cavorting under the bridge. Surely it would only be a matter of time before I joined their ranks. So I found a soup kitchen and asked if they needed help. Mind you, I wasn't a exactly a good person either. I was strictly apathetic when it came to other people's problems, hunger included. I suppose I was preemptively seeking shelter, offering my services at a time when they'd still be accepted, a time when I could pretend the charity was mine and not theirs. Hence continued my celibate existence, a soup kitchen on the corner of Mercy Ave and Malcolm X with the pious sisters of St. Maria Pia, Our Lady of Guadalupe. The next six months passed without a due. I would rise at five to chop onions and skin the avocados and pluck the chickens. If ever I'm truly homeless, I'll go straight to the district with a Mexican city councilman. The sisters and I played checkers after breakfast and the European edition of Risk in the afternoons. We had no idea how they coveted turkey. I began to imagine myself growing old, pale and flaccid, lazy enough to forget my discontent. A life neither lived nor squandered, I would finish my days serving the hapless, faithful to the only promise I'd ever kept. You were wondering, weren't you? Oh yes, dear audience, true to my oath of celibacy I stayed. Dare say I hadn't even masturbated, though being surrounded by festering Vietnam vets and lacking a sensual imagination, I was never quite in the mood. Desire had abandoned me like dignity during a famine. Lust, the relic of a creature I no longer was. Until, of course, the phone rang one steamy Sunday afternoon. I was to accompany the Padre to a watermelon commune due west of town. It was run by a renegade order of St. Maria Pia sisters and headed by a mysterious firebrand who'd come from south of the border several years ago. 
their watermelon patch had been growing at extraordinary rates the past three summers, and the Padre was there to make an offering. Give us the patch, and we'll allow you back into the order. Our Lady of Guadalupe shall welcome you, as was the prodigal son. The leader of the renegade nuns was none impressed. She lifted her veil in anger, revealing a shock of deep brown curls in the most stunning green eyes that side of the Mississippi. Back to your snake's den, good father. The watermelons are mine. I had no idea what was happening. Suddenly, a thick, dark gray enveloped the sky. A burst of dust began to stir on the horizon. The desert was awake. At once, the Padre ran for his conversion van, leaving me behind. That evening, the Southwest saw its most violent tornado in seven decades. Mailboxes were sent flying to Mexico, steeples as far as Kandahar. The Padre never made it back to the city, though I somehow survived. I peeled open my eyes, blinking away the dust from each socket. I could feel something in my hand. I looked up, and entirely clothed and full of rubble, barely made out that deep shock, that shock of deep brown curls. I was in bed, clutching her hand in mine. 